You are now listening to Nailed It, the orthopedic surgery podcast. Dr. Balich, welcome uh, welcome to the Nailed It Ortho podcast. So happy to have you on. And um, I know we've missed each other a couple of times, but now we've finally connected. So uh, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. I'm uh, excited to be here. And listen, that's the life of trying to get two orthopedic surgeons with, <laughs> with busy clinical schedules together. So all good. Happy it finally worked out. Very true. And typically what we do is when we start off is we ask a couple of questions, getting to know you a little bit better, and then we'll dive a little bit deeper into our topic of the day, which is, which is an interesting one. I think this will be our third oncology um, podcast out of like 60 or 70. So we're, we're slowly getting the numbers up, um, but I'm looking forward to it. Excellent. It'll be fun. And kind of the first question, you know, the age old, age old question is what made you choose oncology out of all of the, uh, all of the uh, other specialties? Cause it's uh, not too many people choose it, but the ones that do always have, you know, something interesting or what, what brought you towards that field? Yeah, you're right. Not too many people uh, pick it. There are only about 300 orthopedic oncologists in the entire United States. So we are indeed a very small group. Um, I, I think it comes from a couple of places. One, I've always had a fascination with cancer uh, and cancer biology and, and sort of the science around cancer. Um, and then I found orthopedic surgery and I found orthopedic surgery originally through sports medicine. So sort of the polar opposite of orthopedic oncology. Um, but then when I, uh, you know, early in my residency sort of started to see that I could do orthopedic surgery and cancer, uh, my interest was certainly peaked. And then I was lucky enough to do my residency at the university of Chicago and had three really incredible, um, orthopedic oncology mentors, including Dr. Michael Simon, who is of course, one of the grandfathers, right. One of the like founding, uh, fathers of all of orthopedic oncology as a discipline. Um, Dr. Terry Peabody, uh, who is still clinically practicing and is a chair over at Northwestern, Dr. Rex Hayden, uh, and Dr. Hugh Wu, who's currently one of my partners too, along with Rex Hayden. So I just had some great mentors who, um, made it seem awesome and doable and, and brought the excitement that I was looking for in a subspecialty. And it was just a perfect combination of all those things. And here I am. Yeah. And, and just to reiterate, I've heard, or at least I've heard many people say that it's a high combination of the mentors that you have and like the exposure, because a lot of people uh, don't, or a lot of programs don't have the greatest oncology exposure. And so I guess you're um, fortunate enough to, to be at a place that had a great exposure and great mentors. So I've always heard the, uh, the big part of a lot of, of why a lot of people choose are definitely the mentors and also, you know, secondary to the cases and, you know, the patient population, et cetera. Um, so awesome story. Uh, second question is, uh, we know you are heavily involved in the academic side of things. So, you know, between academics and private practice and, you know, even some locums jobs out there, what made you choose academics? So orthopedic oncology itself is a field that's pretty hard to do in, in private practice. There are only a few of us around the country who are, who are in private practices. Most are, uh, in academic medicine. So from a specialty perspective, it, it sort of forces you, um, that direction, but more broadly than that, I have always loved education and teaching, uh, and being involved with that side of anything I ever explored in my life. I come from sort of a family of educators, not doctors. I'm the only physician in my family, but lots of teachers in my family. And so I think some of that was instilled in me in a really young age. And so I always, uh, sort of envision being part of a university hospital system, you know, and having an impact in education as part of my career. Uh, so it was easy to pick a specialty that that helped me stay in academic medicine. Yeah, yeah. That's, I didn't even think of that as far as um, the actual field. And yeah, now that you say it, yeah, most oncology, I, I know very few, but all that I do know are in some type of academic. So um, yeah, that makes total sense. And third and final question is, we know you're um, up there in uh, Chicago or in the North. Um, do you have any interests outside of orthopedic surgery or things that you like to do? 
Oh, I have lots of interests outside of orthopedic surgery as we all should have. Right. Um, right, yeah. one of them or two of them probably have been curved, curbed a lot because of the uh, COVID pandemic. I love to travel. Uh, so obviously haven't been able to do a lot of that in the last 18 months or so. Um, I love to go out and eat and sort of explore, uh, any kind of great restaurant does not have to be fancy. It can be hole in the wall, can be, you know, it can be fancy, but, um, you know, sort of from top to bottom, I love, uh, sort of getting out there and exploring. And then, um, along with that, I love to cook. So tomorrow night, I'm actually having all of the other female faculty over to my house for dinner. So just before this, I was working on a little prep for tomorrow's dinner. Nice. Uh, so that'll be fun. Yeah, those are probably uh, top three, you know, in addition to being able to do all those things with friends and family, which uh, just sort of doubles the fun. Well, that is uh, pretty awesome. I myself do like to eat. And sometimes those hole in the wall places are uh, are better than like the really fancy places. So oh, yeah, really for sure. Food. Uh, so I'm a, I'm definitely a fan of that. Um, so it's kind of switching gears. And today we're going to talk a little bit about soft tissue sarcomas. And I'm hoping that, you know, we can definitely hit all the hit the high yield points and um, and kind of, I guess, just starting off and because, you know, they're they're sarcomas from all different different types. And I think what we can just in general, what we can talk about is like, how do these typically present like uh, you know, if you have a patient, like what patient that comes to your office should you be concerned about or or this should kind of start to be in the back of your mind of something that may be going on? Yeah, so soft tissue sarcomas in the grand scheme of uh, kind of soft tissue tumors are actually really rare. Um, we only see uh, in in the extremities and um, in the extremities about 6,500 sarcomas a year. So, uh, but when you do see them, uh, you, you know them because in the vast majority of cases, they present actually really, really big. Um, and often it's because the vast majority of them are painless. So people, uh, sort of allow it to get big without paying much attention to it because it doesn't, because they don't hurt. Um, the painful ones usually present to us uh, a bit earlier in their course. That being said, if someone presents to you with a mass or a lump in an arm or a leg or, you know, around the trunk, um, anything that is, uh, deep, right. And when we say deep, we talk about deep as being relative to fascia. So anything that's deep to fascia, um, has a, like sort of a firm consistency to it and is large and, and large, we use the cutoff of about five centimeters. So big, deep, and large, um, should sort of raise alarm bells, uh, that this is something that might not be a lipoma or, uh, a ganglion cyst or something like that, but but something that might need a little bit closer look. Yeah, you took the words right out of my, my, out of my mouth. I was going to say, yeah, so not like an poem, and then you said like poem. I was like, perfect. <laughs> um, and and so, like, are there any patients that are predisposed to having these, uh, to having like soft tissue sarcomas, or any like population which, you know, is, is a, has a higher chance or any associations? Yeah, there are definitely some. The I think the most common is is. Um, patients with neurofibromatosis and NF1 who are at very high risk of getting malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors, also known as MPNSTs. Um, I'm taking care of a young man right now who uh, we just did surgery for his second MPNST. So not a local recurrence, but actually a second primary sarcoma. So wow. um, those, yeah, those patients are actually really high, very high risk. Um, he had a low grade uh, MPNST on the sciatic nerve on his left thigh. And then as part of his staging studies, we picked up a mass in the opposite thigh that turned out to be a high grade MPNST. So two totally different, um, two totally different tumors. Um, uh, Gardner syndrome can predispose patients. We know to, um, extra abdominal desmoid tumors, which are not sarcomas, but they can also be at risk for getting low grade fibrosarcomas. So something to keep in mind, uh, if you see those patients, uh, and then certainly there are some associations with sort of toxins and chemical toxins, uh, and, and agent orange, we don't see a lot of anymore. Thankfully yeah. it's a, that's a historic toxin, but it is something that would predispose, uh, those who were involved in, in activities, uh, where they were exposed to that agent to, um, to develop high grade sarcomas. And, and quick follow-up question for your neurofibromatosis patient. Oh, did, yeah. they, did they just like, they just noticed this, uh, a mass or since it was in the thigh, like, or was it a huge mass or what, what, are the, what was their main complaint? 
Yeah. So MPNSTs in, in patients with NF can present pretty variably. Um, sometimes if they're in, you know, in a big, a big nerve, um, and are sort of growing at the right speed, um, they'll notice pain and new pain patients with neurofibromatosis as you know, can have masses in lots of places, right? They have cutaneous neurofibromas. They can have benign, um, neurofibromas on peripheral nerves, in addition to plexiform neurofibromas, stuff like that. So they have, uh, you know, lumps and bumps in a lot of places. So sometimes that isn't what catches the attention, but rather that something that's been there for a long time has started to change. And that's what, um, that's what happened with his first tumor, the one that was on the sciatic nerve, he started to develop some actual perineal nerve symptoms because this Mm. was, uh, getting bigger. And then, um, like I said, the second one that we picked up really was because of staging studies that we were doing just to keep an eye on the one that had already been excised. Um, and the MRI protocol at our institution, when you order an MRI of the thigh, you get a coronal series that happens to include both legs. Uh, and so it was only because of that, that we saw the tumor on the, on the contralateral side. And when I asked him about it, he was like, oh yeah, that's kind of there, but it doesn't really bother me. So, um, it was actually pretty lucky for him because he had localized disease, uh, you know, no pulmonary metastases or anything like that. So we were able to get to it, I think, uh, sooner than, than had it been left, you know, to chance or for him to identify it as something that was bothersome. Yeah. And I, I'm glad you guys caught that, on um, on imaging that actually leads to a perfect, uh, transition to what I was going to ask next as far as, um, so like what, uh, what type of, um, imaging do you get? You just mentioned MRIs and, and like, what do you see on these different MRIs? I know they, one of the questions they like to ask is what is bright and what is dark? Um, and then what do you get for your staging studies? Like, how does, how does your workup go? Yeah, great question. So, uh, a lot of people sometimes will show up with an x-ray and an x-ray is really minimally helpful in the vast majority of, of cases when we're thinking about a soft tissue mass and specifically a soft tissue sarcoma MRI is your best test. So MRI, uh, obviously gives you the best sort of, um, visibility of it and the best tissue definition. And it lets you see the relationship of the mass to all the critical anatomic structures that we care about. So fascia, bone, nerves, blood vessels, the whole bit you then, you know, right through all the different sequences of the MRI start to understand a little bit more about the characteristics of the tumor for better or worse. Most soft tissue sarcomas have what we call a non-specific appearance to them. So that is, uh, where the mass is predominantly dark on T1, bright on T2, and then enhances with the administration of contrast. And when we say dark and bright, that's uh, relative to skeletal muscle, right? So it's darker than skeletal muscle on a T1, brighter than skeletal muscle on a T2, and then enhances with the administration of contrast. Um, the, the vast majority of sarcomas are staged, uh, simply with, a, with local imaging. So you want to make sure that you image the entire tumor itself in the extremity. And then, um, for distant disease, uh, you do a CT chest to look for pulmonary metastases, because that is the most common location, uh, for soft tissue sarcomas to metastasize a couple of exceptions in all of that. So, um, there is a specific subtype of liposarcoma. So that's a, um, mixoid liposarcoma can, uh, develop those patients can develop metastases into the retroperitoneum. So it's critically important in those to include a CT of the abdomen and pelvis when you do the CT chest, because you want to pick up those retroperitoneal metastases, whether they're present at the time of initial diagnosis or later that is included with their CT chest. Um, and then, you know, we talked about the non-specific appearance of these on MRI. Um, there are a few, and, and we might get to it a little bit later that have, um, have characteristic appearances. But, uh, one of the things to, to know is that, um, liposarcomas, right. Really look like sarcomas more than they do lipomas, right? So a lipoma is a fatty soft tissue tumor. It's in fact, the most common soft tissue tumor, uh, that's out there. Um, and when you uh, get an MRI of those, they should look like fat and, and on any MRI you have, you've got a couple internal controls for normal fat. So one is the subcutaneous fat, right? Everyone, regardless of how thin you are or how not thin you are, there's 
just some subcutaneous fat that serves as a good reference point. And then don't forget that inside, uh, the intramedullary canal of your bones, right? Bone marrow is largely fatty. So you have a couple places to give you a nice reference point and a lipoma, regardless of whether it's a T1 or a T2 or, uh, with or without contrast should really look like fat any way that magnet spins. There's a category of, uh, of lipomas, uh, that in the extremity we consider, and we call atypical lipomatous tumors or atypical lipomas, that when we see those same things in the retroperitoneum are really considered low grade liposarcomas. So, uh, they behave a little differently depending on the anatomic site, but those atypical lipomas will look like benign lipomas, not like a high grade sarcoma. So they won't have that dark on T1, bright on T2 appearance. They will in fact be bright on T1, right? Look like fat on a fat sat T2, like this one here, right? Where fat is all dark. Um, so just something to keep in mind as you, as you look through your MRIs. But I think the biggest take home point is to know that, uh, sarcomas largely have a non-specific appearance and you can't really, um, guess the histologic subtype based on the MRI appearance. You just know that this thing is big and deep deep and heterogeneous looking and enhances with contrast and is worrisome for sarcoma. And just quick follow-up question. When you're getting a CT chest and abdomen and pelvis, are you doing, are you doing the same thing with and without contrast to see if they, you know, if anything lights up or just without contrast or what do you do? Yeah. So the CT chest for sarcoma can actually be done without contrast, which is uh, nice just to avoid that exposure. Um, the abdomen pelvis usually should get done with oral contrast, oral mm. and IV contrast. Okay. And, and you said it, you just mentioned a little bit before that you just know kind of, you have this heterogeneous mass. Um, so then what would be like the next step in, in diagnosing this once you have um, you know, once you see it and you see this heterogeneous mass and you've checked the CT scan and of the chest and there's no, um, the, you know, there's no METs to the, to the chest or anything like that or nothing else that you're concerned of. How do you go about um, what your next step is? Yeah. So next step is you need to establish a tissue diagnosis. So you need to know what it is. Um, and that is, uh, that's accomplished through a biopsy. Um, and so a biopsy can be done uh, a couple of ways. We can do them as a closed needle biopsy with or without sort of radiographic guidance, or they can be done surgically as what we would call an open biopsy. Um, a lot of times uh, these days we tend to do needle biopsies. Our diagnostic accuracy with those over, over the years has gotten much, much better, such that the pathologists, even with very small cores of tissue, um, are able to make really accurate diagnoses. And, and when mm. you do a needle biopsy, um, the cores of tissue are about the diameter of a pencil lead. So uh, they're pretty small and they're only about probably a centimeter or two in size. So not, not huge pieces of tissue. Um, if the mass is in a place that's easily palpable and, uh, away from major neurovascular structures such that it could be biopsied, um, without imaging, we often do those in the, in the office. Um, uh, I saw a patient a few weeks ago who had, uh, you know, big sort of anterolateral thigh mass. The MRI clearly showed that it was away from any major neurovascular structures. And there was a portion of it that was, you know, had a, a thin enough sort of muscle covering that, that I knew with a certain reasonable depth, we could get to it comfortably for the patient. And we were able to, um, do the biopsy in clinic right then and there, which is, is nice. Cause it just expedites, um, helping that patient get a diagnosis versus having it go to radiology where they do it with ultrasound or, you know, under CAT scan guidance for some deeper, more, uh, more difficult to access tumors. When we do do open biopsies, right? So that's when we take someone to the operating room, make an incision directly over it, get into the tumor, take a sample, and then close everything up. Um, you got to be really careful with those. And it's something we um, teach our residents, certainly at the University of Chicago, about the, the principles of open biopsy um, and how those should be done. So a couple of key points is that you want to make sure that, um, if you're doing the biopsy, you have some, uh, sense of how that tumor is going to be resected because that biopsy tract needs to be removed with the entire tumor, right. After they've had, um, sort of neoadjuvant treatments, if they're, if they're applicable. And so putting a biopsy in a wrong spot can have significant com consequences for the patient and could change a surgery that, 
uh, you know, was planned as a limb salvage or could have been done as a limb salvage to, uh, to an amputation, right. And sort of the worst case scenario. So you want to make sure you have a sense of what the surgical resection is going to be like before you do a biopsy. Um, the other thing is always biopsy through longitudinal incisions that again, can be more easily excised, uh, with the, with the whole tumor when the time comes. Um, there are lots of little details about, uh, hemostasis and how you pass the tissue you and, and the proper use of instruments, but it is something that you want to make sure you have just the basics, uh, the basics and the fundamentals of biopsy down, uh, in your mind and, and in your, you know, in your notes and stuff like that before you dive into one. Yeah. And I think those are all, I've seen all of those, uh, points, um, uh, I think either on questions or just, um, just reinforced just through uh, talking, especially the longitudinal um, incisions. I've seen questions where they'll show you different tracks of where you would do the biopsy and one would be going through like multiple compartments and one would be going through one. They generally want you to choose the one that goes through just like, you know, one compartment and um, is in line with your future planned resection. And I know they, they sometimes talk about, you know, when you have um, a lot of, or the, the, a question stem will like sometimes say like, you know, this patient had a sarcoma or they thought it was just a lipoma and they went in and took it out and they realized it was a sarcoma. And then they're always like, what should you do? And I think for those typically, at least what I've read, the answer would be like, you know, take them back and go back and excise everything out the way, the way it should be. Um, and moving forward, um, we know a lot of these have Mets and I just wanted to see if really quick, if you could cover, which of these soft tissue sarcomas um, we should just be worried about and uh, their common, you know, the common metastasis place. I know there's some different acronyms for different things, but um, if you could just touch base on that. The most common place for soft tissue sarcomas to metastasize is to the lung. Uh, and that is uh, something we mentioned earlier, right? So because of that, that's why we get a CT chest on any patient with a soft tissue sarcoma. Um, but there is a subset of tumor types that do metastasize to lymph nodes. So it's a little more unusual for that to happen. And, uh, to help you remember that there is an acronym and it, and they are commonly known as the scare tumors. So though that's synovial sarcoma C for clear cell sarcoma, a for angiosarcoma, R for rhabdomyosarcoma and E for epithelioid sarcoma. So those um, get approached a little bit differently. Sometimes there are, uh, they get PET scans instead of a CT chest. Sometimes uh, they get sentinel lymph node biopsies, um, but know that, that those are the ones that do go to lymph nodes and then um, get approached a little bit differently than, than a typical high-grade pleomorphic sarcoma or something like a high-grade fibrosarcoma. Yeah. And, and I think they were high yield and I've seen that on questions where they just like show an MRI slice of a lymph node and, and put one of those tumors there and ask you to choose like which one it is. So yep. <laughs> knowing that, um, knowing that acronym, I can help you remember like snow sarcoma, clear cell, angio, rhabdo, or epithelioid. Definitely and helpful. moving forward. Yeah. Super helpful. And uh, moving forward to kind of just a generalized treatment of these. And then afterwards we can talk about these individual sarcomas themselves, but what's the typical treatment for a soft tissue sarcoma? So uh, when we think about cancers in general, there are three treatments that are typically can be applied. Uh, so one is chemotherapies, one is radiation therapy, and then the other one is surgery. So because this is orthopedic surgery, we certainly operate on all the soft tissue sarcomas, not because we like surgery, but because we know that, um, that can be curative for these. So every soft tissue sarcoma, certainly that's localized is treated with surgery. Um, any tumor that is, it is big, especially those that are high grade, we also add radiation, uh, to that. And then the application of chemotherapy, whether kind of traditional chemotherapies, uh, or some of the more modern, um, kind of systemic targeted therapies, uh, are, we really think about those on a, on a case by case or histology by histology basis that, uh, I think you're not typically asked about on tests. So, so chemotherapy is definitely a plus minus, but, uh, farther down on the kind of down on the priority list surgery and radiation though, uh, we think about, um, nearly all the time for, for a high grade soft tissue sarcoma. 
And, and why do you give, you know, I, I'll read and they'll say like, you give 50 GYs and post-op, you give 60. Any reason as to why you give more radiation post-op? Just yeah. Radiation. So um, a couple of things about radiation. So the goal of radiation is to help with local disease control, right? So radiation is applied to the area of the tumor, right? Or the area where the tumor had previously been. And it's, it's to help the tumor from coming back in that spot. So when you think about pre-op radiation, it has a couple of advantages um, because the radiation oncologist can see like literally with the CAT scan where the tumor is, they can um, sort of hone the field in to make the radiation field smaller. And because of that, and because they know the exact borders of it, they can give a really focused dose of radiation there. Um, the downside to giving pre-op radiation is that, um, it impedes wound healing on the back end. So when you radiate to 50 gray, and then you do surgery four or six weeks later, uh, people can be at risk for wound healing complications in the post-op, um, uh, in post-op radiation, the, the tumor's now been removed. There's, uh, you know, potentially hematoma in the space, some reactive change in the perisurgical bed. Um, you don't have really clear margins. So the area of radiation is, is actually bigger than it is in pre-op. And then the dose that's administered is higher because of all of that and the physics of it, which is above my understanding, but they certainly get a higher dose. The downside to post-op radiation is that because the dose is higher and the area is bigger, you see more radiation related side effects like fibrosis, more lymphedema, um, higher risk of pathologic fracture. If bone is in the radiation field, things like that. The one important thing to know though, is that compared to pre-op and post-op, the rate of local recurrence. So that local disease control is the same. So from a from a cancer treatment perspective, um, they're the same. You just kind of pick your poison about which, which radiation related complications you want to deal with. And I think in the current world, most of us, um, and certainly at our institution, uh, prefer to do pre-op radiation. Okay. That makes perfect sense. A great explanation too, by the way. And so what I figured what we could do now is kind of go through these different types of soft tissue sarcomas and kind of we can go on by like different groups, you know, uh, and I guess touch on kind of the high yield points and things that you think we need to know about. Uh, first one being our, our fibrous tumors. If you want to take us through that, you can, if you want, you can quickly mention the benign ones. We don't really need to go into detail since we're really here for the uh, malignant ones, the sarcomas. No problem. So yeah, there's a whole category of benign and probably not worth getting into a lot of the details. Um, we'll think about the, the fibrous, um, the malignant fibrous tumors and those in general are the, um, the fibrosarcomas, uh, that, that appear in a relatively similar age range to most soft tissue sarcomas. So adults, right. in a 30 to 80, and they present really similarly. I think one of the, one of the things to remember about the vast majority of sarcomas is that they show up similarly, right. They are these enlarging, like we said in the beginning, generally painless masses that are deep and big. Um, and so those are the, and we see that commonly with fibrosarcomas. Um, the, the most common subtype is uh, the undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcomas, which we, we kind of think about side by side with some of these. Um, and they, again, present the exact same way, average, you know, adults sort of sometimes older adults. Um, and again, with this painless enlarging, enlarging mass, um, histologically, the two are a little bit different. Fibrosarcomas, uh, are the ones that we think about with that, um, the herringbone sort of organization. So you'll see the, the cells and the, the spindle shaped, uh, sarcomatous cells organizing themselves in that, in that herringbone or almost like a zigzag pattern. If, if you look at it sort of at a low enough magnification, you'll have the perspective to be able to see that. The undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcomas in contrast kind of don't look like anything that they're supposed to look like, right? They're undifferentiated, they're pleomorphic. They oftentimes just look really crazy and really bad. So you'll see really huge mitotic figures. So cells that have, you know, 90 million chromosomes in them <laughs> instead of the number they're actually supposed to have from one cell to the other cell, right? There's a lot of variability in size and shape and appearance. And that's the classic presentation of an undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma. 
and and that used to be called malignant uh, fibrous fibro- histiocytoma, correct? But that name has been uh, that name has been retired. <laughs> Yeah. And so when we're looking at, and correct me if I'm wrong, so when we're looking at like these sarcoma, uh, sarcomas underneath like the microscope, one of the big things that we look for, like the spindle cells, right? Like the little, mm-hmm. um, I, mean, I don't know how else to describe them, but spindle cells, they, they look like That's it, they're, know, they're elongated, yeah, elongated spindle shaped cells. And so, like, that's the main thing that we should look for that let's know it's a sarcoma. And then we look at other, clues to uh of the slide to try to figure out what kind of a sarcoma is is that the, am i thinking are, like are we thinking about that the right way as far yeah. as like, trying to get a diagnosis no you are and and you want to look for some of the right some of those patterns like we talked about with the mfh that that we mentioned the one thing you want to you want to look for to make sure that you're not seeing right because they'll throw that in on a test for you is the glandular organization of carcinomas so things that look like they are organizing into, uh, you know, alveoli or um, breast glands or, or clear cells of kidney tumors, stuff like that, right? Those are not sarcomas. So sarcomas tend to be highly cellular, really dense. Um, you are certainly seeing this, the spindled cells, right? That that's the classic appearance of a, of a sarcoma cell. Um, but then you also want to look for the things that show you that it's a malignancy and high grade. So pleomorphic, uh, features, right. That it looks, um, that no two cells look the same. You want to look for mitotic figures. So, um, indications that cells are dividing really rapidly and that this thing is, is biologically very active. And then some of the patterns that, that I think we'll continue to talk about, right? Like the story form pattern of, of, um, an undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma or that herringbone pattern of the, um, of the fibrosarcoma. And sometimes, um, what we talk about with synovial sarcomas, you see these slits in them, which is classic for those too. So, um, understanding and committing some of those patterns to memory can be helpful. Um, but oftentimes the test questions, right. Cause that's where, that's where I think residents get hung up the most is, Oh my gosh, how do I know what to do? Don't yeah. forget to read the test question. That's going to give you a lot of clues to help you narrow down what you're looking for. And then, you'll, you'll be able to tell the difference between something is benign that's benign and less densely cellular than a sarcoma versus something that's organizing into glands, right? That's a carcinoma, a metastatic carcinoma versus something that looks like sort of cartilage, right? Or benign hypocellular cartilage. And, and usually the things they give you are all pretty different on the test. So recognizing hypercellular, um, you know, a degree of pleomorphism or atypia, mitotic figures, and then some of the patterns of the sort of the arrangement of the cells um, of a sarcoma should help you get it. Yeah. And I remember with a lot of these uh, like definitions, like story of form and herringbone, like I had no idea what those were. So I had to Google what those were. And then, so you learn like two different things in one to try to figure out what they're talking about, but no, that makes perfect sense. So for this, just to repeat for the undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, we're looking for that story of form, or I guess they call it kind of a cartwheel pattern. Um, you looked at, at different, you know, mitotic, um, a lot of different mitotic figures, spindle cells versus when we look at a fibrosarcoma, they still have this, uh, the spindle shaped cells, but they're the, organized and more of that herringbone, uh, that herringbone pattern or that, you know, the kind of that zigzaggedy pattern when it's, when it's viewed on a low, on, on a low field on the, on the microscope. And yeah. You can see it a the, lot better at low, at a lower power. And the question, if there is a question, it'll, it'll still be similar, like, you know, slow, you know, mass that's growing. <laughs> you got it. And that's the, right. That's, uh, sort of the blessing and the curse of these is that um, the question on the exam has to narrow you into sarcoma uh, because, right, that no one's going to ask you um, the difference between treatment for a fibrosarcoma and a high grade undifferentiated sarcoma because they're pretty similar. So, um, what you really need to be able to do is pick out sarcoma from not sarcoma. Yeah. And that was, that was a, a perfect transition to. Just quickly, the, the treatment for both of these is, is just pretty much similar to what we were talking about, like wide, um, you know, wide margin, local excision. And then 
if it's large tumor, use radiation, or do you just always use radiation for these tumors? Or I guess that, that's a good question. You always yeah, use radiation so for these? Or? Certainly tumors that are high grade and big uh, always get radiation. So grade plays into it too. Um, tumors that are low grade and small, less than five centimeters, uh, we typically do not give radiation to. And then there's a, there's a gray area in between all of those, um, that our radiation oncologists who are at our multidisciplinary, uh, conferences, right. Discuss with us sort of the risks and benefits of, um, of treating those. And, and we make those decisions based on histology and a number of other factors, but big high grade, those get radiation, small, low grade, those do not get radiation. Perfect. And our next group of tumors are kind of these fatty tissue tumors. Can you take us through some of you, you briefly talked us through a little bit earlier as far as imaging on lipoma versus liposarcoma, but can you kind of take us through these, um, these uh, fatty uh, sarcomas? Yeah, liposarcomas uh, are, are also actually pretty common for us to see, probably more common than the um, than pure fibrosarcomas. So we see a lot of liposarcomas. And then there are a couple of different variants of them. There are spindle cell liposarcomas, there are round cell liposarcomas, there are myxoid liposarcomas, et cetera. And so, um, and those are based on, you know, some of the associated cells. Uh, what you want to look for in a liposarcoma um, is uh, lipoblasts. That's kind of the pathognomonic cell for a liposarcoma. So in a normal lipoma, you're going to be see big um, sort of univaculated adipocytes, um, really tiny nuclei, right? They're very acellular, largely, right? Sort of minimally cellular, not acellular, but pretty minimally cellular. Uh, sarcomas though, are going to start to look hypercellular, you're going to have pleomorphism. You're going to have one cell that when you compare it to the, its neighbor next to it, those two cells don't look the same. Uh, things look like they might've been coming from who knows where. And though you might see some sort of normal fat cells, what you really want to look for are those lipoblasts. And so lipoblasts, um, are multivacuolated, um, cells with, uh, often eccentric, uh, eccentric nuclei. And, and, um, for those of you who are watching this on YouTube, there's a great picture of some lipoblasts, uh, there, but they are tiny little multivacuolated things. And so as soon as you see those, you know, you're dealing with a liposarcoma. Um, and then the, the additional features, right. Come in sort of at a higher level, but, um, getting this into the category of liposarcoma, then you're, you're in a good place to know what to do with it next, especially on an exam. Yeah. And so the MD, MD2, I always see that, that they always, you know, MD, MD2 stain positive. Is that just for liposarcomas or can you also have that in a lipoma? So a plain lipoma uh, will not have, um, will not have MDM2 amplification. So um, MDM2 is uh, a gene product that we can uh, stain for, um, that the pathologist can stain for, and it helps to differentiate a lipoma from a well-differentiated um, or these uh, atypical lipomas that we think of in the extremity that the general surgeons call a low grade, right? Lipoma like liposarcoma. So um, presence of MDM2 lets you know that you're not dealing with a plain lipoma, but more an atypical lipoma. Um, and that's really how they are, uh, how they're used to help us. Okay. And can you quickly like walk us through some of the main, this is just a, if those watching on, on YouTube, this is a, a slide from pictures I got straight from Miller uh, for reviews. And they kind of go through a difference to what to look for lipoma versus liposarcoma versus the differentiated liposarcoma. So can you quickly uh, or briefly just kind of point out the high yield points for us to know. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so lipomas, right, are going to be tumors that are, are composed of, uh, benign, right. Benign appearing, uh, fatty fat cells, right. So when you spin that, uh, that magnet in the MRI, that tumor is going to look like fat, regardless of it's a T1, you know, a fat sat T2, a proton dense, it's always going to look like just homogeneous fat. And then histologically, right, has no features concerning for any kind of malignancy. Atypical lipomas, right, or the, these, um, when they're in the retroperitoneum, like low grade lipoma, like liposarcomas, um, start to get a little bit more heterogeneous. You may see some stranding in them. Um, right. So they're not as sort of 
homogeneous and, and ISO intense with fat. And then histologically, you see that same thing. You're going to see more cellular areas in it. Um, but again, it's not going to have the degree of pleomorphism, the amount of, um, mitotic activity that, uh, that a high grade sarcoma has those low grade liposarcomas are going to be MDM two positive, um, as are your D differentiated liposarcomas. And so as the name implies a D diff liposarcoma is something that has lost its cellular differentiation. So that when you start to look at those cells in that very high grade D differentiated component, you can't tell visually, right. That they were ever fat cells or that they were trying to become adipocytes. And so it's that mixed in with characteristic features of a liposarcoma. So seeing lipoblasts having MDM2 positivity helps, you know, that that's a de-differentiated liposarcoma, which is, is a high grade soft tissue sarcoma and treated as such with radiation, big surgery, stuff like that. Whereas these, the other two are treated simply with a marginal excision. So all all great question. points. Yes, no, okay, it, it, it definitely <laughs> did. It, it for sure did. And and quickly touch on the. I know we mentioned there are a bunch of different subtypes. And at, at first, when I was first thinking, I was like, oh, there's no way they're gonna ask this on the subtypes on the exams. But I was I was quickly wrong, uh, and and had to try to figure out how to. Um, note some of these different subtypes and yeah and the subtypes they like grades. the most I, I have seen um they like the mixoid liposarcoma and they like the d diff liposarcoma because you can see those um really clearly some of the the low grade subtypes are hard to distinguish and probably a bit too a bit too challenging but that mixoid liposarcoma has a couple of good characteristic features so you're yeah. going to see some adipocytes you then need to be able to identify all those little lipoblasts so again the multivacuolated um cells. And then what you'll notice is that they're sitting in a background of mixoid matrix. So mixoid matrix, um, stains, uh, basophilic. So it's a little bluish, a little bit purplish, and it's going to look like this sort of loose disorganized. It's one of my mentors used to say, it looks like snot for lack of a better <laughs> word. Right. But that's a good, and if you've ever cut into one of these or operated on a mixoid tumor of any sort. Well, I was going to say, if you've ever blown your nose, that's what I thought I, I thought this was about to say. But that's what <laughs> like, mixoid sort of looks like and has the appearance. So if you can use your imagination and see this sort of loose bluish stroma wrapped around all these little adipocytes and, and most importantly, lipoblasts, you know, you're dealing with a mixoid liposarcoma. Okay. And I know they always talk about like that. I've always seen that like translocation between yes. 12 and 16 always associated with mixed liposarcoma. That's why they like to ask that. That's an easily testable point. Yeah. And then, and then our pleomorphic versus our differentiated, how do you tell uh, the difference between the, these are our high grade um, liposarcomas that have high chance yep. of METs. Yep. Yep. So pleomorphic sarcoma, um, is going to look like, uh, this, a high grade sarcoma, but you still see some, some features in the sarcoma itself. Right. So that stuff that if you're watching this on YouTube, like on that slide on the right, that there's these fat cells and lipoblasts mixed in with the sarcomatous cells, right. You're seeing mitotic figures. There's one in the kind of upper right corner that looks like it's got you know, a bazillion condensed chromosomes in it. Yeah. That one right under. So just to the right there on the edge, right? So you're seeing this all mixed together in a de-differentiated liposarcoma. You see kind of normal appearing fat, right? Or some normal appearing fat cells juxtaposed with an area of high grade, uh, sarcoma, right? A tissue that appears to be a high grade sarcoma where there's not as much of the, the kind of lipoblast and stuff mixed into it, but rather you're looking at kind of more normal ish fat sitting right next to high grade sarcoma. So that in that image that's there, you can see the areas that look kind of like a lipoma. If you looked at that, you know, one corner in isolation, but then there's this stuff next to it that looks really cellular. Um, that if we got that under high power, you'd see the mitotic figures, you'd see the pleomorphic bism, you'd see the, the nuclear atypia, the whole bit. Awesome. 
and and moving forth to some neural tissue tumors can you walk us through some of these uh we we mentioned one a little bit earlier in conjunction with neurofibromatosis but can you yes. walk us through these so the mpnst is the is the sort of poster child of malignant nerve nerve sheath tumors as it's uh as its name would imply um and it has two benign kind of correlates and those are um schwannomas and neurofibromas um I don't want to get into a ton on the benign stuff because our job here is to talk about sarcomas, but we see MPNSTs like we talked about earlier in patients with neurofibromatosis, but you can get them in patients without NF, right? They can just show up on their own, like any other um, soft tissue sarcoma. You're going to see those same characteristics. So hypercellular, lots of spindle cells here. They, they tend to organize in a whirling pattern. So different than your herringbone, different than your storyform. These are whirling and they will be S100 positive, which is common for any type of nerve tumor. But histologically, these look uh, a lot more biologically aggressive than their benign counterparts. Yeah. And and do these typically progress? I mean, I assume if they're, you know, they're close by nerves that they would, pre- they may present with some nerve symptoms. Uh, you know, is that, is that a common in your experience? Did you see them? Hey, I'm having like, if this posterior tibial uh, or tibial nerve, they come with, Hey, I'm also having some, you know, I'm just in tingling in the bottom of my foot. Plus there's this mass or is it more just, there's this mass. I think it, yeah, I mean, some do and some don't, it depends on how rapidly the mass has grown and, and how much, it's, it's compressed and where that nerve is and stuff like that. But oftentimes nerve tumors present earlier because they tend to be symptomatic just for that reason. Okay. They're so in or on a nerve. And when you bump it, right? Like, woof. Ooh, that hurts. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So big things to know about nerve tumors is definitely like that whirling pattern that you talked about um, in, in comparison to the herringbone pattern when we were talking about fibrosarcoma and the storyoform pattern that we were talking about with undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, which are, those are fibrous tissues. This is a neural tissue. And then this is S100 positive and, uh, treatment for these is, is pretty much the same, you know, wide vision plus minus radi- radiation. Plus radiation. Yep. Pl- plus, usually radiation. plus radiation for the high grade ones. And then, um, chemotherapy, much more controversial, uh, a treatment option. Now, what about for our muscle t- tumors, which I, I hear one of them isn't as controversial for chemotherapy versus the others? Correct. So uh, leiomyosarcomas, um, uh, sort of extra uterine leiomyosarcomas, right? We all learned in medical school about uterine leiomyosarcomas, but we can see them um, within the extremities uh, are treated like all of the other um all of the other soft tissue sarcomas. Um, but characteristically what you see here are cells with what we describe as cigar shaped nuclei. So these elongated, but rounded, uh, sort of rounded nuclei. Um, and again, they get treated with surgery and radiation, um, and then, you know, sort of more controversially plus or minus chemotherapy. Rhabdomyosarcomas are probably kind of a category on, onto their own. We, they are sarcomas and they're the most common pediatric soft tissue sarcoma. Um, but they have their own very particular staging system, uh, and treatment is dependent on size and resectability and a number of things that we don't take into consideration, uh, for many other soft tissue sarcomas. That being said, these tend to be very chemo sensitive. So chemotherapy is usually always part of the treatment regimen for these patients. Um, in addition to surgery and radiation, radiation. And then, um, again, because, you know, translocations are easily testable. There's a, yes. there's a, a 213 translocation, um, with the PAX FKHR gene rearrangement. So, uh, a good one to, to put on your like last minute cramming list. Yes. So just to reiterate our mixed liposarcoma was 12, 16, uh, rhabdomyosarcoma is 213 for AX dash FKHR gene. And how do you tell the difference between, I, I still have trouble with this, the difference between leomyosarcoma and rhabdomyosarcoma on the ecology? Yep. So again, we talked about leomyosarcomas having those cigar shaped, uh, right? Sort of cigar right. shaped nuclei. So elongated and rounded. Whereas um, rhabdomyosarcomas uh, have really. Um, 
small sort of rounded cells with not a lot of cytoplasm in a lot of situations, sometimes they will start to organize in, in some patterns where there's, um, kind of an eosinophilic matrix between them. Um, they, there are some descriptions of them being called sort of racket shaped cells, although that's a description that's, that's never sort of <laughs> clicked in my brain. Um, yeah. but they, they look like, uh, they almost tend to look right. Like a, like a small round blue cell tumor, but with some, um, with some matrix around them. Okay. Yeah, that makes, that makes sense. And, um, moving forward, we have some vascular tumors we know, and, uh, one, one of these sarcomas, if you don't mind walking us through that. Yeah. So, uh, the benign vascular tumors that we see commonly here and that I, certainly I, um, see commonly in my office are hemangiomas or vascular malformations or atrovenous malformations, whatever you want to call them. And then the malignant counterpart is an angiosarcoma. Um, these we see often, uh, in the setting of some sort of, uh, other condition. So whether it's, um, after, uh, years after sort of radiation for a breast cancer or, in the setting of chronic lymphedema or chronic vascular stasis or, um, you know, old trauma, even you can get this, uh, really rapidly enlarging and often ulcerating mass, um, that, uh, that, and these can be pretty painful because they ulcerate. And so, uh, histologically, when you look at these, um, you're going to see the features of a, of a sarcoma, right? So, cellular, right? This has a lot of cells in it. And if you were to put this next to a benign vascular tumor, like there's no way those have this sort of appearance to it. So they're going to be, um, highly, highly, uh, highly cellular. You're going to see mitotic figures as you do, even on this slide at relatively low power, but, and then the cells, uh, start to resemble sort of blood vessel endothelium, and they may even be organized into some, you know, sort of endovascular spaces and stuff like that. These are very, very, very aggressive tumors with really, um, poor survival associated with them. They can go, uh, to lymph nodes and, and to pulmonary sites. It's really common for people to have met Mets even at presentation. So, um, a lot of times these need to get treated with big surgeries. A lot of these patients have amputations, um, because of their location and their size. Uh, and then often we, um, you know, if you're able to do a limb salvage procedure, uh, we do apply radiation to these again, because they are often big and certainly high grade. And is this one of those tumors that you would use sclerotherapy on, or is that more just for like the benign? No, that's for the benign. Needs? Yeah. For the benign, yeah. we love using sclerotherapy and our, you know, our embolization of those, but this, um, this, you've got to get the tumor out. So we can do sclerotherapies for sort of symptomatic management of benign vascular tumors, because we don't need to remove right? The vascular malformation, it can sit there. It's not doing anything bad. This guy, if you leave it there, right? This angiosarcoma is going to be bad. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Not, not going to be good for sure. No. And uh, we have a couple more here before we finish up. It's kind of a, one of our synovial uh, disorders is, or, you know, we always hear about synovial sarcoma. And can you walk us through this, you know, their properties I would see on an X-ray and then we can touch on any other high yield points? Yeah. So sarcoma? I think one of the important things to do is sort of detach synovial sarcomas from synovial blazed neoplasms um, because synovial sarcomas, though they are periarticular, um, it's like very, 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 very unusual for them to arise from within a joint. Um, they are named a synovial sarcoma because historically when the pathologists were looking at them, they, they were sort of felt to resemble, um, synovial tissue, but that's, that's really it. It, it would probably do everybody well to rename these. Um, but we haven't this. gotten there yet. <laughs> so yeah, they occur, um, they occur in uh, kind of young, young adults. So, uh, sort of late adolescence, young adulthood into the, you know, late thirties, um, sort of age, like I mentioned, they are periarticular. Um, and, and oftentimes they'll go through this, like, it'll be there for a while and they'll have this like slow, maybe there was a small mass and then all of a sudden they'll just like explode in size. Um, so that's not an uncommon presentation. Um, we see them around the foot and ankle around the knee, um, certainly, you know, can be around any major, any major or even minor joint, uh, at that, um, 
this is one of the soft tissue tumors where there can be some mineralizations. If you again are watching the YouTube, the one you have here is probably one of the most impressive, uh, <laughs> it's an impressive amount of mineralization in these. Normally, um, they tend to be these little kind of stellate uh, mineralizations that are very um, radiographically different than the rounded flea boliths we see with um, hemangiomas. Um, so sometimes, you know, if you're in clinic and, and you're thinking this, gosh, this could be a synovial sarcoma an x-ray actually might be helpful. You know, if you want to get a little more information before you get an MRI, um, these are one of the, right. The tumors in that scare group that can go to, can go to lymph nodes. Uh, so they often have some additional staging studies, uh, but otherwise are treated similarly because these happen in a younger age group who can tolerate chemotherapy. We tend to treat them with chemotherapy more frequently than some of the other sarcoma subtypes. Um, but they also usually get radiation, the usual surgery. Uh, and then when they get off to the lab, you know, the, the pathologists love to look for that X18 translocation to confirm the diagnosis, uh, of this. Certainly when we, certainly when we biopsy and then once it's, uh, you know, once it's been treated, but that's also an easily testable translocation and a good one to remember. Yes. Don't remember that for those listening, remember that X18 <laughs> translocation for synovial sarcoma. Then they, they'll talk tricky and they'll, they'll put like YT dash SSX one, which gene and products and or SYT and SSX two. So know that as well, in addition to the X18. And uh, can you describe this? Because um, you know, I've, I, at first time I was like a biphasic uh, on 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 um on his I, I didn't really I, I assumed biphasic phases, but I didn't really know exactly. So can you describe uh, synovial sarcoma and what we'd see on histology, like some of the key things to, that we should know? Yeah, absolutely. So you're going to see, you know, a lot of the similar features of another high-grade sarcoma. So the cells are going to be spindle shaped. You're going to see a hypercellular, um, a hypercellular lesion, uh, really densely packed, and, and they're going to start to organize themselves uh, into... Um, sometimes like these little, these little clumps, and then you will start to see slits between them. Um, there are, as you mentioned, right, there's monophasic and biphasic variants of, uh, of synovial sarcomas with the biphasics. You kind of see the two parts of it. One, you're seeing all the spindled cells, and then you're going to see another area that looks a little bit more gland like, um, where they're trying to make some epithelial structures, right. And you might have some little glandular lumen, right. Those are the slits that have some, um, some mucin in them, uh, that right. Doesn't stain with, with anything. Um, but then that spindle cell component is where the, the cells kind of come together and they run in fascicles, uh, and start to look maybe right. Like some of the other patterns that we've described before, but you're looking for sort of two distinct, um, organizations of the cells within that, within that one sarcoma. And so for this picture, the ones that are listening to YouTube, you would say that these right here, would be that spindle cell component. And then these like this little pink area, or would you call the epithelial uh, cell or epithelioid, I guess. The component? So the pink, those are probably actually some red blood cells there, but ah. if you look over to the left there, that part that's oh, um, even farther to the left. Right there. Oh, right here. Yeah. Like that kind of area ah. or maybe up in the top right corner, right. That starts to look a little bit more glandular but you definitely wow. have good examples of all the fascicles there. Yeah. The okay. Cool. Sort of organization. Per and I, we barely have any more left. Of, I think it would maybe like two or three more. We can quickly go over. Uh, there's another one of those scare, the ones that go to the lymph node and talking about epithelioid uh, sarcoma. So what is that? You know, first my thought is, oh, it's sarcoma of the skin, but it's not, but it's epithelioid. I mean, it's like skin, I, you know, can you clear <laughs> So epithelioid uh, refers to kind of the shape of those, of those cells um, that you see there. So epithelioid sarcomas are um, one of the most common uh, right in the upper extremities. Usually we see them commonly around the hand, uh, the hand wrist. I've seen them around the elbow, um, similar to the angiosarcomas. These, these can often present um, as ulcerating masses. So if you see an ulcerating mass, that should be um, 
that should sort of uh, raise the alarm bells for things like uh, like an epithelioid sarcoma. But then what you see is these like plump polygonal uh, cells, and you may have some intermixed uh, spindle cells that that get arranged sort of loosely, right? You can almost see the the space between each of the cells here. Um, And that's a pretty typical uh, appearance for an epithelioid sarcoma that you see these nice kind of plump, um, plump chubby cells, right? Nuclei with nice plump cytoplasm around them. That's the best, uh, the best probably way to, to see them and think about that. And if you were to put this next to any of the other ones, right. You don't see that like elongated spindly pointy cytoplasm look to these. And, and so, uh, they have this nice, I don't know, plump, fat, cute, pink cytoplasm. <laughs> they almost look like cartoon characters, right. Compared to some of the other mm. things that we, that we saw. And so these are treated, uh, you know, like many other sarcomas that we talked about with wide surgical resection. Uh, and sometimes we, we add radiation to these two, depending on the size and location radiation around the hand is, is a little more tough to deal with just because of the, um, fibrotic side effects that come along with it. So we try not to radiate hands if we can avoid it. Mm-hmm. Makes perfect sense. And I think this is probably the last one of our scare or our, our mnemonic is our clear cell car- sarcoma. Is that what, anything we need to know about these? So clear cell sarcomas are, uh, are much more rare. Um, and, uh, we see them, uh, growing sometimes around or in associations with, uh, kind of tendons or, or aponeuroses. Um, and what you'll see is these, um, really kind of dense collection of cells that organize into like nests or fascicles, um, and then when you look at them on higher power, which this is like a great low power to sort of show you that, um, that architecture, um, you'll see clear cytoplasm, but you'll be able to see kind of the cytoplasm right adjacent to the, to the nuclei. Occasionally you can see some giant cells within them. Um, but the bottom line is that thing is important thing is to remember is that it's part of that scare group. So you have to think about lymph nodes, um, with these, but, that being said, the treatment is similar to all the other soft tissue sarcomas we talked about, right? So just a nice wide resection and radiation. That's the, that again, is the nice thing about sarcomas. If you have to take a guess, surgery and radiation is the treatment. Uh, and, and normally this is like, you would see like a patellar tendon or like, a, um, or, um, what's another tendon, like the, like, like an elbow, like a triceps tendon or. Or is it just like, it, that just happens to sometimes just be in some different, it's like, is there anything that's more common than others? Uh, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. They are so rare. I mean, I think uh, nationally, we probably see like less than 15 of these a year across the country. Wow. Right. Very so they're, rare. yeah, they're super, super rare. Um, so I don't off the top of my head, uh, I can't narrow the like most common sort of anatomic location for these. Yeah. Super. And I think the last sarcoma soft tissue sarcoma, we have a alveolar cell sarcoma. Um, I assume this does not come from the lung. Uh, so no. can you, <laughs> can you uh, help, help give us a little bit of information as far as alveolar cell sarcoma? So, uh, like many of the others that we've talked about, right. Their name is, is not necessarily about where they come from, but sort of how they organize and what they look like under the microscope. And, and unfortunately some of that historic, uh, those historic descriptions haven't, haven't modernized, but, um, these, uh, we see commonly in kind of young adults. So, uh, similar to things like the rhabdomyosarcomas, um, which we can see into young adulthood and synovial sarcomas. Um, and for whatever reason, they show up a little more commonly in the anterior thigh, not entirely, uh, sure why that's the case, but what you see histologically, um, is this nest like, right. Or sort of alveolar glandular, like arrangement of, of cells, um, with some kind of trabeculae dividing them and, or, and helping sort of to organize them in these, um, kind of gland like or alveolar, like, um, 
sections, if that makes sense. Um, and it can, occasionally you can have some like clear spaces that these uh, cells are arranged around, uh, again, giving it its, its name based on just its, its organization and sort of histologic appearance. And you guessed it. The treatment is just like all the others, <laughs> surgical <laughs> resection and radiation. Yeah. <laughs> well, Watch, I appreciate you for coming on the podcast. I think this was great. Um, overview and we kind of went and, and talked about different soft tissue sarcomas. We talked about the, how they looked under histology, the locations, um, you know, the high points to know about them, how they present, how to treat, which we should all, if anybody listens to this podcast and gets a question about soft tissue sarcoma, hopefully they should be able to get it. Or if an attending has some, hopefully they're able to answer the question. Um, it, before we wrap up, is there anything else that you would like the um, listeners or people to know about soft sarcomas. No, I think we hit all the, we hit all the high points and even some of the, of the minutia. Thanks for asking some really good questions. <laughs> uh, it was great. I think, um, you know, remember the basics of, uh, of treatment, right? Again, surgery and radiation don't underestimate. And then don't forget sort of the fundamentals of the imaging appearance of these, um, know what, you know, your, your normal, uh, anatomy and sort of normal tissue structure should look like, right. Know the difference between a, something that's a lipoma and that's not a lipoma. And if it's not a lipoma, right, your warning bells should go off that this is something you might need to phone a friend for some help with in, in the real world. Well, again, thank you so much. Um, very, very well, uh, well concluded and and very well stated. Um, we appreciate you again for coming on the podcast. At the end of these, I always let you know all of our guests know if there's anything that you want our followers to follow you on, whether it's social media or any anything that you want to promote. Feel free to, if you want to say it for now, go for it. If not, that's completely fine as well. Thank you. I am on Twitter and Instagram at tbalachmd. Uh, I can't say I'm like the most prolific uh, tweeter out there. Um, I, I tweet a lot for our medical school, or sorry, our medical student curriculum called Ortho Access. Um, so for those of you who are working with fourth year students, it's a great resource for them. And I'd encourage you to, to send them that direction. But uh, you can find me there too at Ortho Access Info at tbalachmd. And uh, happy to help you with all your tumor questions if you need them. Well, Dr. Balch, again, I think this has been a, a great episode. Uh, again, thank you so much for coming on the show. For those listening, thank you all for listening to yet another episode of the Nail Adult Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this. We hope you go and leave us a review and tell us how much you enjoyed this episode. And uh, follow Dr. Balch on, um, on Instagram and Twitter. And we'll put a link to her uh, social media in our description as well on the site. So uh, until next week. <laughs>